I have talked about the connection, the deep and profound connection between relationships and health, relationships and resilience, relationships and mental health and emotional well-being. And there is an abundance of studies that corroborate the importance of relationships for all these things with the impact being it affects longevity. I described the nature of the relationship as a dance between being fully oneself and being in close connection with others at the same time. I have spoken about the contours and limits of relationships that really in this life, given our limitations, we can only have two or three really close friends, our spouse included, maybe up to 50 people that we know very well and they know us very well, and up to 150 the scientists tell us, only up to 150 of people that we can know to some extent so that we can trust them under the right conditions and have some kind of connection to them. It is a dynamic system with people sliding in and out of each level. Relationships are composed of people from our family our extended family, and our friendship circles. We need both. The balance between the relationships with family and friends and congregational friends is a complex, ever-changing one. But the bottom line is, and this is something a fellowship like this helps us do, is maximize our connections with others using a combination of family and friends. The point of the relationship is to maximize our sense of belongingness, relatedness, groundedness, support, and protection it is a deep and profound need within each of us. I have spoken of the congregation, this in any congregation, as a promoter of health, healthy, and healing relationships. A congregation, although it does many different things, including educate us and educate children and help us focus on social action activities and a myriad other things. One of the things it does is encourages, fosters, and supports nourishing relationships. And although a fellowship or any religious group does many things, this is foundational because if there isn't trust and deep connectedness, we really can't do anything. We can't really succeed in any objective or aspiration we might have. It is important, therefore, to know what fosters healthy relationships. The covenant which we recite each Sunday is one of the ways in which we educate and remind ourselves about what truly fosters healthy relationships. But it is also important to know what negates and harms and undermines relationships. And so that is my topic today. The power of the cutoff or the emotional relational disruption. One of the ways people talk or people react to tensions in a relationship is to distance from the others. Marriage partners do it all the time. Uh, members of a, of a group of any kind do it all the time as a way to manage the anxiety 
in any relationship and as a way to moderate the difficulties of any relationship, we all from time to time distance ourselves from those who are closest to us, and that is a healthy thing. It is part of the yin and yang of relationships. Some degree of distancing happens in literally every single relationship of every type in the lives of everyone here. Emotional cutoff, however, is an intense version of this natural ebb and flow of relationships. A cutoff is when people severely limit or completely stop seeing another who is close, either by family or by friendship. And this becomes a habitual pattern. We can also think of a cutoff as the severing of a relationship. The cutoff is alluring. It's seductive because it seems like a harmless action. No one is hurt. No need for angry words or messy or difficult conversations. A person can feel better instantly after a cutoff, but the problems remain dormant and not resolved. One of my mentors, Rabbi Edwin Friedman, used to say that the cutoff was more violent than physical violence for a relationship. A cutoff can be the result of many different things. It can be the result of an unwise decision, a hasty action, an error in judgment. But a cutoff can also occur when a relationship becomes toxic. I have read of a number of stories of people, for example, who have left their religious faith of choice through a very arduous process because for them it was toxic. There's a book recently published called Bad Mormon. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's about someone in their arduous process of separating from this religion that had a strong grip on them. Or a cutoff can occur as a result of a decision made for good and prudent reasons a son or a daughter moving to another part of the country for economic or career reasons, though made for sound reasons, can potentially be a cutoff depending on how it is managed. Or sometimes an emotional cutoff occurs because of circumstances outside of the control of anyone. Consider the person, for example, who comes to terms with their sexual identity that is not the norm for society and tells that to their parents and their parents reject them because of that or because of their religious faith or any number of reasons. And a cutoff occurs and it is profoundly painful. Another example is an unexpected or sudden death or a death at a young age. They too are forms of emotional severing or cutoff, although no one is at fault for it. Cutoffs are ubiquitous in extended families, congregations, and groups of all kinds at every level of society. They fuel a lot of the polarities and craziness of our society politically right now. The cutoff is a profoundly powerful force in human relationships. So a cutoff can be a break in a relationship of any kind, sometimes intentional, sometimes created by circumstances beyond one's control, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not so good reasons. Also, a cutoff can be moderated by maintaining 
at least some ongoing contact with the persons originally cut off from. But some of the very most powerful cutoffs are intergenerational, multi-generational. And here's where the real power of the cutoff influences human life. Emotional cutoff can take hold of a family system and it be passed down from generation to generation and become how people automatically behave without even being aware of it. Let me give you an example of what I mean. And please remember as I proceed, there is no judgment anywhere for what I have to say. If we all knew the power of the multi-generational process, we would never ever think in terms of judgment again about ourselves or others. But let me talk from my own family's experience. <clears throat> my great-grandmother, Carolyn Sorensen, <clears throat> was born in Copenhagen, Denmark in 1862. The man she married, Niels Peter Jensen, also born in Copenhagen, and they married in 1882. Both had immigrated to the United States. That is a huge cutoff from one's family of origin. Even though some family members were still here, that is a humongous cutoff. Remember, no internet, no iPhone. And also, note that it was taken for probably sound reasons. I, I assume, I hope they weren't fleeing from the law, that it was for economic reasons, but given my family, I really can't say that with conviction. By 1883, they were living in Oak Park, Illinois, and gave birth to a daughter, my grandmother, Rosa Grace Jensen, in 1883. Rosa, my grandmother on my mother's side, married David Mitchell, my grandfather on my mother's side. David was born in 1883 in Swansea, Wales, hence my reference earlier. By age eight, David had immigrated with his family to the U.S. when his father had moved to this country when he was about 28. So both sides of my mother's family had immigrated to the U.S. Well, one generation from that, one from Wales, the other from Denmark. This was a form of cutoff, though taken apparently, I hope, for sound reasons. It was mitigated somewhat by some family members living in the Illinois area. Fast forward. Rosa, my grandmother, died when my mother was 18 years old. She died of cancer. My mother was close to her and was heartbroken. This was a great loss for my mother to absorb. The death of my mother's mother was a form of cutoff, which is to say an emotional, an abrupt emotional disruption, the severing of a relationship. This is part of the human condition. It is no one's fault. My mother's father then married a woman who my mother and her siblings did not like. My mother got out of this uncomfortable situation by getting married and starting a life of her own. The death of my mother's mother and the unhappy relationships with the new mother created a cutoff in the Mitchell family. However, this was in the context of a massive cutoff in the generation that preceded that. So my mother's family, the Mitchells, was permeated with cutoffs. 
I wish to emphasize once again, as I have before, there is no judgment anywhere in this. People are caught up in patterns of distancing for which they have no responsibility in creating. My mother very vigorously attempted to maintain family connections. We visited relatives in uh, Lake Geneva, uh, Wisconsin, in the Chicago area, in the Pennsylvania area, in New Jersey, <clears throat> in other places. But after her passing, the Mitchell family settled back into the cutoff as the norm. Now let's look at the present. There are cutoffs everywhere you look in the Mitchell side of my lineage. Not so much the Brocks, who will gladly take you out to eat, my father's side, but the Mitchells, there's cutoffs everywhere. No, no one to blame. One of my mother's <clears throat> brothers has three living children. Contact with them has been brief, sporadic, awkward, and challenging. One of them lives in Glen, uh, Greensboro. That's nearby, right? <laughs> I have, before my wife told me I was going to be arrested for stalking, I went to his house and left a note. I left a several messages on his phone. He owns 12 fast food franchises in Greensboro. I want some free meals. <laughs> and he will not contact me. What should I do? If you know him, give me a call. Ron Mitchell is his name. I'll, I'll do that. So <clears throat> I have tried to maintain contact with another cousin who is eternally elusive. Why? The third one I don't even know about, and he works for a super secret agency in Washington, D.C., so nobody can even talk to him. A mentality of cutoff becomes the way people interact in the Mitchell branch of my family unconsciously, automatically, due to the pattern established in the family through the generations. Do you see the power of the multi generational process? Now, here's the thing. When cutoffs exist in important relationships, especially with family, people seek to compensate for that emotional disconnection by seeking in new relationships a replacement and a substitute for the relationship from which they have been cut off from. And when that happens, the person seeking the new relationship make those relationships too important. What do I mean by that? For example, a man, let's take a simple example, who cuts off or is cut off from his family of origin, looks to his spouse, his children, and his friends, perhaps even his church, to meet his needs for emotional support. That's okay, but the person brings unrealistically high expectations to those relationships. I can tell you as an interim minister that after all, this congregation here is perfect. I'm talking about other congregations. <laughs> but I can tell you without doubt, I've seen all kinds of dynamics that the people in Unitarian Universalist congregations who give the most grief to the leaders of a congregation and or the minister are those who most desperately need the church to be perfect. Do you see what I'm saying? Because that hunger that every, the, 
that the new family confer, confirm in every way a perfection that has been denied them in other relationships. To further elaborate, the person cut off from their family of origin may try to substitute for the families cut off from new families in social, religious, or work relationships. And that makes that person vulnerable to pressuring the people in all those new relationships to accommodate and meet their expectations of what others should be and do. That's pressure. When a person, as another example, breaks away from their fam religion or their family of origin, that's almost all of us here, by the way, certainly me, they become more vulnerable that their new religion or faith accommodate their expectations of perfection. This makes them vulnerable to pressuring or attempting to pressure their new religious group or congregation to act in certain ways to accommodate their expectations. Our society today, for a variety of reasons, exhibits an enormous vulnerability to the cutoff. A certain representative in the US Congress, who's from Georgia, who I won't mention, decided to mark President's Day by stating that the red states should break off from the United States of America. We need a national divorce. And divorce, of course, is an, another form of cutoff. We need a national divorce. We need to separate by red states and blue states, etc. Everyone I talk to says this. If you go to a UU congregation, people won't talk that way. <laughs> so the power of the cutoff is profoundly strong. So I conclude with these remarks. An emotional cutoff is a way people resolve their unresolved emotional issues with parents, siblings, and other family members by reducing or totally cutting off emotional contact with them. It feels so good. It's painless, at least initially. But an emotional cutoff can also occur out of necessity by accident, due to tragedy. Think for a moment what a monumental cutoff that was placed on people who were brought from Africa to be enslaved people here. What a profound cutoff was placed on black people in America just by that one act. Or cutoffs can come because of some need for growth or betterment or improvement. When I was a young man, I was quite sure I did not want to live out all my life in Birmingham, Alabama. So I ventured out to the whole wide world of at least of the United States to taste and experience other parts of the world and, and other cultures, and that was a good thing, but it was also a cutoff. Yes, a cutoff can be both positive and productive in some case, but it always involves risk and potential danger. The most powerful influence of the cutoff, without any doubt, is the multi-generational force of the cutoff. It is almost always the case that if a person exhibits a cutoff orientation, they are part of an intergenerational process that they are probably largely unconscious of. Eliminate the notion of judgment. If we see individuals within the framework of the intergenerational process, we would never judge 
another human being or ourselves ever again. Nonetheless, I believe it is important to try to bridge the cutoffs where we can, most especially those related to our family of origin, because that's where the problems began. So I will tirelessly keep pursuing my cousins. <laughs> but also, it is important to be on the lookout for cutoff symptoms within ourselves. Remember, a cutoff pattern can be unconsciously and powerfully at work in a person's life. Cutoffs in one part of a person's life, especially with family, generates unrealistic expectations that appear in other relationships. And some of these signs of the cutoff and the power of the cutoff in us may be expecting perfection from others, having unrealistic expectations of what others should be or do for yourself, attempting to be highly controlling in a relationship. You must do this, you must do that. Being biased by the negative outcomes of previous relationships, thus creating an inability to begin again in love, to exercise a reasonable degree of trust. The ultimate goal is to try each of us to maximize our relationships. And that means distributing our needs across a wide spectrum of people and therefore bringing less pressure to any one of these relationships to be perfect. But to also try to create quality in each of those connections by upholding mutual respect, mutual openness and equality. George O'Dell wrote a poem that I share with you now about how important we are to one another and how important it is to remember that. He wrote, we need each other. We need one another when we mourn and would be comforted. We need one another when we would accomplish some great purpose and cannot do it alone. We need one another when we are in trouble and afraid. We need one another when we are in despair, in temptation, and need to be recalled to our best selves again. We need one another in our hour of defeat when with encouragement we might endure and stand again. All our lives we are in need and others are in need of us.